Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we continue in our studies, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction, so that we may more properly understand not only the times in which we are living, but to be able to compare these times with, the, with what has gone before us, so that we may have a clearer concept of not only what is before us, but begin to understand more fully the work that is going to be most necessary for us. Shall we now ask his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for the time that we may spend coming together with other brothers and sisters where we may learn more fully of you and may come to an understanding of many of these things that have gone on before us. As we open your word and the word of your prophet, we ask now, Father, that our minds might be opened so that we may be able to more fully receive that which we will soon study. We thank you, Father, for these opportunities. For we can see that this world is soon to come to an end. We know, Father, that there are many that had joined with us that are no longer with us. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction. May we be able to show your mercy <coughs> with them. May your words and that of your prophets have an impact upon our heart. Direct us now as we come together. I ask, Father, for a blessing on each one that is gathered here this morning and for those that will view this later via the internet. Help us now. May your angels attend us. May your spirit show us that which we most need within our lives and within our characters so that we may go forward together to give the message that you would have given to this earth. For this we ask, for this we thank you, and for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. As a student, one of the things that I enjoyed the most was the study of history. And there was a reason is because I came to appreciate many of the points of history and what it could teach me and show me. Now, <clears throat> directly, we are going to get into a study today with events that herein will have been recounted and took place between 627 and 587 BC. Now, why is that important? What can we say about this time period? Well, this is the 40 years that is brought to view in Ezekiel chapter 4, when okay. uh, Ezekiel lies on his right side for 40 days. Right. Is it also not 50 years after Manasseh had been taken captive? Yes. Are we also <clears throat> within a year to see the destruction of the temple? Yeah, in 586. So can we say that this time period is very important within church history? Most certainly. Now, we're going to look at this in some detail. Much of what I have looked at in comparing and preparing for this presentation 
came from reviewing much of what Brother Stephen had presented in his tabled history. <clears throat> this document is important for all of us to review, to study, and to understand. For there is much light yet to be revealed. This has revealed so much light right now. And the more we are willing to tax our minds to consider the points that are made, the more light we will find. The unfaltering servants of God have usually suffered the bitterest persecution from false teachers of religion. But the true prophets will ever prefer reproach and even death rather than unfaithfulness to God. The infinite eye is upon the instruments of divine reproof, and they bear a heavy responsibility. But God regards the injury done to them through misrepresentation, falsehood, or abuse the same as though it were done unto himself and will punish accordingly. Testimony 27 Page 37.1. <clears throat> when we are presenting a message to the corporate church, to those that have walked away from the message, from those to those that are not accepting all of the message, And we encounter persecution from those that claim to be disciples of Christ, but are not. When we are misrepresented, when falsehoods are told about us, or where we are abused, God views this as if this is done to himself. How fearful of a statement is this? Well, it gives justification for the words, uh, fear the Lord. Yes, it does. Consider well what Brother Stephen brought up, that this is the 40 years represented by the 40 days of Ezekiel 4. The princes of Judah had heard concerning the words of Jeremiah and come up from the king's house and sat in the empty uh, sat in the entry of the Lord's house. <clears throat> they have left the king's house. They have come to the temple, to the very entry of the temple. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die. For he hath prophesied against this city. And as ye have heard with your ears. But Jeremiah stood boldly before the princes and the people declaring. The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city. All the words which you have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings. And obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I am in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and seemeth meet unto you. But know ye for certain that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants thereof. So she's using this as her um, as her validation as to what she just said in the previous paragraph. Amen. <clears throat> but look too that this is bringing innocent blood upon the princes, upon the city, and upon the inhabitants. How much more complete could that be? Not too much more, except for maybe the beast of the field. Okay. 
For of a truth, the Lord hath sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. Jeremiah 26, 11 to 15. <clears throat> Had the prophet been intimidated by the threats of those in high authority and the clamoring of the rabble, the message would have been without effect and he would have lost his life. But the courage which he discharged his painful duty commanded the respect of the people and turned the princes of Israel in his favor. Thus God raised up defenders for his servant. They reasoned with the priests and the false prophets, showing them how unwise would be the extreme measures which they advocated. <clears throat> Who advocated putting Jeremiah to death? Jehoiakim. Uh, the priests and the false prophets, right? Does this not show a confederacy between those that have heard the word of God and not accepted it against those that are proclaiming the word of God? And yes, Je Jehoiakim is correct. The influence of these powerful persons produced a reaction in the minds of the people. Then the elders united in protesting against the decision of the priests regarding the fate of Jeremiah. They cited the case of Micah, who prophesied judgments upon Jerusalem, saying, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountains of the house as the high places of a forest. Micah 3.12. They put to them the question, did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord and beseech the Lord? And the Lord repented him of the evil which he had pronounced against them? Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. Jeremiah 26, 19. So through the pleading of Ahiakim and others, <clears throat> the prophet Jeremiah's life was spared. Although many of the priests and the false prophets would have been pleased had he been put to death on the plea of sedition. For they could not endure the truths that he uttered exposing their wickedness. What does this say about this time? Were there not many elders, ministers, leaders of the church <clears throat> that were very happy when the voice of Elder Jeff was silenced. Were there not many that have taken it that the warnings of the seven times of Leviticus have now been silenced and they can now go back to their carnal slumbers? Have we not seen this, brothers and sisters, within this very movement? But Israel remained unrepentant, and the Lord saw that they must be punished for their sin. So he instructed Jeremiah to make yokes and bonds and place them upon his neck and send them to the king of Edom, to the king of Moab, to the king of the Ammonites, to the king of Tyrus and Zidon, commanding the messengers to say that God had given all these lands to Nebuchadnezzar, 
the king of Babylon, that all these nations should serve him, serve Babylon and his descendants for a certain time till God should deliver them. They were to declare that if those nations refused to serve the king of Babylon, they should be punished with the famine, with the sword, and the pestilence, till they should be consumed. Therefore, said the Lord, hearken not ye to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you to remove you far from your land, <clears throat> and that I should drive you out, and that ye should perish. But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those will I let remain still in their own land, saith the Lord. And they shall till it and dwell therein. Jeremiah 27, 9 to 11. So who are we not to hearken to? Uh, the sorcerers, the soothsayers, the dreamers, the enchanters, diviners, all of those. Exactly. <clears throat> but if we count what is outlined, we have prophets, we have diviners, dreamers, enchanters, and sorcerers. How many are called out? Five. Are these five unwise virgins? Absolutely. More than a possibility. When we are looking at those that are to have light in their lamps, we are to have the understanding of those that prepared for the coming of the Lord. These, these prophets these diviners, these dreamers, these enchanters, and these sorcerers are not prepared. They are giving us an example of the five unwise that will not be admitted to the wedding feast. Jeremiah declared that they were to wear the yoke of servitude for 70 years. And the captives that were already in the hands of the king of Babylon and the vessels of the Lord house, Lord's house, which had been taken, <clears throat> were also to remain in Babylon till that time had elapsed. But at the end of the 70 years, God would deliver them from their captivity and would punish their oppressors and bring into subjection the proud king of Babylon. Ambassadors had come from the various nations named to consult with the king of Judah as to the matter of engaging in battle with the king of Babylon. So here we have the Moabites, the Ammonites, all of these other nations have now come to Judah. But the prophet of God bearing the symbols of subjection delivered the message of the Lord to these nations, commanding them to bear it to their several kings. This was the lightest punishment that a merciful God could inflict upon so rebellious a people. But if they warred against the decree of servitude, they were to feel the full vigor of his chastisement. They were faithfully warned not to listen to their false teachers who prophesied lies. The amazement of the assembled councils of nations knew no bounds when Jeremiah, carrying the yoke of sub subjection about his neck, made known to them the will of God. But Hananiah, 
one of the false prophets against whom God had warned the people through Jeremiah, lifted up his voice in opposition to the prophecy declared, wishing to gain the favor of the king and his court. He affirmed that God had given him words of encouragement for the Jews. Who was Hananiah seeking favor of? Is he not seeking the favor of the civil authority? It, is he not, in so seeking this civil authority, trying to turn the view of the people from God? Said he, Within two full years will I bring again unto this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Jeremiah 28, 3 and 4. Jeremiah to the presence, in the presence of all the priests and the people, said it was the earnest wish of his heart that God would so favor his people that the vessels of the Lord's house might be returned and the captives brought back from Babylon. But this could only be done on condition that the people repented and turned from their evil way to the obedience of God's law. Jeremiah loved his country and ardently wished that the desolation predicted might be averted by the humiliation of the people. But he knew the wish was vain. He hoped the punishment of Israel would be as light as possible. Therefore, he earnestly entreated them to submit to the king of Babylon for the time that the Lord had specified. He entreated them to hear the words that he spoke. He cited them to the prophecies of Hosea, of Habakkuk, of Zephaniah, and others whose messages of reproof and warning had been similar to his own. What does this statement mean to us that choose to study history? Well, not to answer your question directly, but to, um, you know, when we look at this situation, we can definitely see the parallel to the present time um, in that we are expecting fulfillments of prophecies, which are false, even though they have a mixture of truth in them. And um, instead of understanding the history of this movement, instead of taking time to understand all of the lines and how they are applied, we just pick and choose the things that we want. And this, there's this work of repentance that needs to happen first. You know, if God is going to bless us. In this situation, <clears throat> I am not being led to make accusation against any person. As you are pointing out here, we are studying this as a message. 
as we are looking at this and the parallels with what is going on currently. We have the parallel for this time with Jeremiah. Jeremiah is speaking at a time that looks dark for Jerusalem. Jeremiah is citing to these people the prophecies of Hosea, of Habakkuk, and of Zephaniah, all of which preceded him. We have been studying Zephaniah as a book. Now, if Zephaniah preceded Jeremiah, is it not logical that Zephaniah also preceded Daniel? Um. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what you mean by preceded in the sense that they they wrote messages that were previous to Je Jeremiah's message. That's here. what I mean. But Jeremiah began his prophesying in the time of Josiah. So he's, he's going to prophesy for basically this whole period of 40 years, which, um, you know, Daniel's book is writ written at the end of the captivity, though it's still... Right. Uh, it starts with information that happens, um, you know, with the death, you know, two years after the death of Josiah. So they kind of overlap. I mean, different ones overlap in different places. Correct. Yeah. He referred them to events which had transpired in their history in fulfillment of the prophecies of retribution for unrepented sins. This, in studying history, is what we are doing today. Sometimes, as in this case, men had arisen in opposition to the message of God and predicted peace and prosperity to quiet the fears of the people and gain the favor of those in high places. But in every past instance, the judgment of God had been visited upon Israel, as the true prophets had indicated. Said he, the prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Jeremiah 28 verse 9. If Israel chose to run the risk, future developments would effectually decide which was the false prophet. <clears throat> the message that we are to give is not one of peace and safety. Amen. Now, if I have read table history correctly, should I understand that Zephaniah would have prophesied between 645 and 627 BC, roughly an 18-year period, during the reign of Josiah and before the ministry of Jeremiah? If I'm incorrect, I stand ready to be corrected. So, Stephen, do you have any information about that? Um, yeah, I think just uh, Zephaniah. I think, I think it is that the chapter starts off saying that he did prophesy in the time of Josiah, doesn't it? I think 1 verse 1. Um. Yeah, because but I, I don't know. I could, don't know how much I could pin it down. You know the exact dates. Okay. Yeah, he does. Yeah, it's just in the days of Josiah. So, 
Um, so exactly when in Josiah's reign he began prophesying, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, because you call it like a, a 31 year period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when it says he's the son of Z uh, Gedaliah uh, in Zephaniah, Zeph Zephaniah one one, which which Gedaliah would that be? That's because there's the Gedaliah that's the governor. Um, in uh, five eighty six. But it would it's probably be early in Josiah's reign, you know, it would be uh, Jeremiah starts to prophesy in his 13th year. Yeah. So uh, I would say Zephaniah is probably sort of uh, prophesying around that time or before it. Yeah, it's hard to say exactly when in Josiah's reign, though, did he prophesize? Okay. But it, it's probably earlier, but it's hard to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both for that. But Hananiah, incensed at this, took the yoke from Jeremiah's neck and broke it. And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, from the necks of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Jeremiah 28, 11. He had done his work. He had warned the people of their danger. He had pointed out the only course by which they could regain the favor of God. But they had mocked his words. Men in responsible positions had denounced him and tried to arouse the people to put him to death. Yet his only crime was in faithfully delivering the message of God to an unbelieving people. Does not this statement give a good representation of Elder Jeff leading up to July 18th? And does this not describe the portion of the movement right now that is continuing to study and continuing to look to understand what God would have done. There are many who profess to keep the commandments of God who are appropriating to their own use the means which the Lord has entrusted to them and which should come into his treasury. They rob God in tithes, tithes and offerings. They dissemble and withhold from God to their own hurt. They bring leanness and poverty upon themselves and darkness upon the church because of their covetousness in disassembling, in robbing God in tithes and offerings. Those who work in the fear of God to rid the church of hindrances and to correct grievous wrongs that the people of God may see the necessity of abhorring sin and that they may prosper in purity and the name of God be glorified will ever meet with resisting influences from the unconsecrated. Zephaniah describes the true state of this class and the terrible judgments that will come upon them. These judgments will come upon those that are resisting influences 
and are unconsecrated. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and will punish the men that are settled on their lees that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Zephaniah 1.12. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and is of desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all of them that dwell in the land. Zephaniah 1, 14 to 18. It is in the time of conflict when the true color should be flung to the breeze. It is then the standard bearers need to be firm and let their true position be known. It is then the skill of every true soldier for the right is tested. Shirks can never wear the laurels of victory. Those who are true and loyal will not conceal the fact, but will put heart and might in the work and venture their all in the struggle. Let the battle turn as it will. God is a sin-hating God. All those who will encourage the sinner saying, it is well with thee, God will curse. We are not to be giving a peace and safety message. Confessions of sin made at the right time to relieve the people of God will be accepted of him. But there are those among us who will make confessions, as did Achan, too late to save themselves. God may prove them and give them another trial for the sake of his people to evidence to them that they will not endure one test, one proving of God. They are not in harmony with right. They despise the straight testimony that reaches the heart. And they would rejoice to see everyone silenced that gives reproof. The people of Israel had been gradually losing their fear and their reverence for God until his word through Joshua had no weight with them. In his days did Hiel the Bethelite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua the son of Nun. 1 Kings 16.34 When we seek to rebuild Jericho, when we seek to organize as a church and not remain as a movement, are we not, as the people of Israel, losing our fear and reverence for God? Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a couple of ob observations here. Um, well, I, I note the date, September 23rd. Yes. 
And of course, we know that that is in early writings, page 74. That's the date that's given that she has that vision in 1850. But we know it's October 23rd. Right. But it, it still becomes this symbol. Now, 723, of course, is when uh, Northern Israel uh, begins their 2520. And right. even September is the ninth month. I understand that. It was also the seventh month at one time. Actually, until the, the calendar was changed. Uh, so at the time they changed the calendar in the United States, uh, it was uh, um, at the end of February that they, they actually changed the year. It was very odd. Um, so, But the fact that September even was originally called the seventh month, that's why it's September. So I take September 23 to represent 723. Right. <clears throat> then we also have it, it, it's in... 1873, when we see the 187 there and the number three. So, you know, it's not 1872, which we would normally find significance in. But, um, and then we have, of course, this message regarding the rebuilding of Jericho, which has to do with the seven times. So, all of these things come together to speak to this movement right now, the symbols there for this movement to understand. The messages that were being given <clears throat> in these documents from Sister White have great weight upon us at this time. We need to consider these carefully we need <clears throat> to accept these and take them to heart. Now, as I was putting this together, I was led to the following document. Manuscript 165 of 1898. Please note, this was considered as a non-published NP document, even though portions were published in Today with God, page 356, 5 MR 370, and 15 manuscript release, 165 to 166. This was written 13th of December of 1898, but it is the title that I think is the most telling. Unity, a test of discipleship. Yeah. So Stephen just notes that it's the um, 1873 is 144 years prior to the presentation I made regarding July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. So that was September 23rd, 2017. So that's 144 years to the day. Isn't that interesting? We have 144 years with a presentation that was to be for those that would be of the 144,000. Serious symbol for a very serious time. Nice pickup. If unity is a test of discipleship, then disunity is a revelation of those that are not disciples of Christ. Would you have a problem with that statement? Would there be any that would have a problem with that statement? Yep. And they departed thence and they passed through Galilee and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, 
the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise on the third day. Mark 9, 30 and 31. After saying this, Christ gave his disciples an opportunity to ask him more particularly in regard to the meaning of his words. But they were thinking and talking of a very different subject. <clears throat> when they reached Capernaum, Christ asked them, what was it that ye disputed amongst yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed amongst themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desireth to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Mark 9. 33 to 35. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 27 and 28. Christ gave his disciples a most important lesson in regard to who should be his disciples. In the kingdom that I am about to set up, he said, strife for supremacy shall have no place. All ye are brethren. All my servants shall be equal. Only the greatest recognize that there will be greatness of humility and devotion to the service of others. How many of the disciples sought to cast others out? He that humbleth himself shall be exalted, <clears throat> and he that exalteth himself shall be abased. He who seeks to serve others by self-denial and self-sacrifice will be given the attributes of character that commend themselves to God and develop wisdom, true patience, forbearance, kindness, compassion. This gives him the chiefest place in the kingdom of God. The Son of Man humbled himself to become the servant of God. He submitted to abasement and self-sacrifice, even to death, to give freedom and life and a place in his kingdom, to those who believe on him, he gave his life as a ransom for many. This should be enough to make those who are continually seeking to be first and striving for supremacy ashamed of their course. Do we read the hearts of others? Can we read the hearts of others? No. When we are looking at situations, when there are those that would cast us out, we are not dealing with Christ. We are not dealing with his disciples. He that will come after me, Christ said, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9.23. This is the proof of discipleship. If church members, if those of the movement would be doers of the word as they solemnly pledged themselves to be when they received baptism. They would love their brethren and would be constantly seeking for unity and harmony. It's wonderful to have baptismal vows. It's fantastic that we would seek to say, this is what we are giving up.
But what does it state here? If church members would be doers of the word, they would love their brethren and would be constantly seeking for unity and harmony. How much more direct can we be? How much more direct can she be at this time? How much more do we need to be told? of our responsibility this message this presentation is open to all at this point we seek I seek the input of my brothers and sisters. Your input is greatly appreciated. We seek to understand these things fully, to come together in a spirit where we are studying together, where we are looking to understand things so that we may be more united as the body of Christ. Now, there's this comment in the in the chat there that you responded to, uh, where Ron asks about because um, he's going back to uh, the rebuilding of Jericho, right? And so his his question is: the rebuilding of Jericho was linked to brother and sister White's oldest and youngest son's deaths for starting the SDA church. He asked, do I remember correctly? Now, I would say that that's, that's only partly correct. Okay. In, um, the reason that the church organized in 1863 was because the church was Laodicean. So organization was needed at that time. That is, it's the failure of God's people that led to organization. Did I understand this? Uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm asking from a historical standpoint. Mm -hmm. Did this not take place over a three-year period with the yeah. death of the youngest in 1860? Yep, so in 1860 and 1863. So following the, the giving of the name, Seventh-day Adventist, which was first given in 1860, that they decided upon a name, even before they had organized the church. Um, that's the setting up of the gates, because on the gates, you would put the name of a city, right? Right. Agreed. So the youngest dies at the setting up of the gates, and the eldest dies at the laying of the foundation. Correct. And of course, these happen chiastically compared to the story of C. Gubb and the other guy's name, um, right? That is, right. You have the foundation set up first and then the gates set up at the end. In this case, the gates are set up in 1860 and the foundation in 1863, right? Correct. Understand it. So the eldest son, um, uh, that's going to be Henry, who dies in 1863. They both die in December. So they're three years apart now, but it's not so much the setting up of the church. It's actually the rejection of the seven times because the rebuilding of Jericho is a rejection of the seven times that took Jericho down. Is it also not, not just the rejection of the, of the seven times? but the choice that they made that they were to be organized under the laws of the country. In other words, they were accepting the civil authority as their ruler over them rather than accepting God. But that's more symbolic. I mean, Ellen White is behind the organization and James White too in 1863. So this is God under God's order. 
but it's because of the condition of the church right. that organization became necessary. But we do have these symbolic attachments to it, such as uh, using the, the laws of Maryland, right? Yeah, well, the, the laws of Maryland, that portion came later. Well, that's later? Okay. Because what was occurring in 1863, of course, was the Civil War. Right. And they had chosen that they wish to accept being organized as a church to keep their young men from having to be conscripted into the armies of the United States. Yeah, and that, and that was part of the thing that helped push it in that direction. Because there's still lots of people um, not interested in organization. They didn't want the church to organize. So, um, but I don't look at organization in any, any of Ellen White's writings that somehow they were doing something wrong in organizing. I, I just might have said that wrong. Um, yeah. It was to me, it was a, a result of that organization or the reasons for the organization. Yeah. You're just saying, is it linked? I mean, yeah, it, it, it was it was definitely some sort of a linkage to it. That was what uh, yeah. Jeff was uh, teaching us earlier. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's partly partly right in the sense that there's no to it. Yeah, I believe that to be true. There's more to it. Yeah. yeah. And to me, it's more about the rejection of the seven times that the rebuilding of Jericho occurs. Right. So, so we know that Henry, he slept on the charts, the 1863 chart material that was right. down and, and caught a cold, which eventually turned into pneumonia that killed him. So, so there's that connection there. And we were studying the, um, on that Jericho, and we decided that uh, it was from a rejection of the of the curse because of of circumstances and what was that we were they sent out warnings beforehand. You know, um, this is the way it's going to be. If you don't like it, we're going to destroy you. Basically, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that was what they were doing. They were. They were going ahead of them and telling them that um, you got a choice coming up. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're talking about. About when uh, when they when they did the Jericho thing, they they went to them beforehand and told okay. them about what the Lord's plan was for them. They didn't agree with it, and so then they basically locked their doors to them, and that's when they the the Lord took over. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what you're referring to. What What are you referring to? Because I, I, uh, okay, so um, Moses had told them, or God told Moses that they were to go in uh, before they were to destroy any place. They were to go and oh, I see uh, what you're talking reason about. with them first, and then they didn't reason with them with that in that respect, and so that's why Jericho fell was because they they chose not to reason with the Israel. Okay, I don't remember that. But... Uh, I kind of recall that in our studies a, a while back. Yeah, I'll have to go. I'll have to go to the. I don't remember that. Anyway. Okay, so go on, Dwight. Sorry about that. No, 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 yeah, no. Me too. I'm sorry. No, brothers, we need to address these points. We need to make sure that we are clear upon these points so that together we may go forward. The whole point of this, the whole point of this presentation, as we have been studying Zephaniah, Mrs. White is bringing out specific points that are very valid to the movement today. If we have things that we are unclear on or that we disagree about, 
we need to bring them up, address them fully, so that we may then go on together. No apology is needed, nor is it necessary. What we are doing right now is what we should be doing. Each that are here today are valued brothers and sisters. Your opinion, <clears throat> your questions, your thoughts are all appreciated. If it gives, excuse me sorry it gives everybody an opportunity to get clarity exactly and in this I am not speaking Spanish I am not speaking German I am not speaking Russian I am trying to address this as directly as possible for us today. Clarity is most necessary. Therefore, if church members would be doers of the word, they would love their brethren and would be constantly seeking for unity and harmony. And as Jesus called the little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, 2 and 3. The world's Redeemer spoke these words, and no one need misunderstand them. If we rearranged those numbers and we came to 1832, what would there be in the history of the Advent movement that would be important to note from there? Uh, credentializing William Miller. And what? Why what? 1833? Well, wasn't he first given his credentials in 1832 and then more widely in 1833? Possibly. I, I can't remember. I just know we always mark 1833. Right. But what led to him receiving his credentials? Well, he first, I mean, he started preaching in 1831. Did he not first study yeah. According to what we now call Miller's rules. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Are not Miller's rules simple enough that a child can understand them? Evidently not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. That's fine. Well, the thing is to humble himself as a little child. Right. You know, one of the things about... Um, where she talks about um, if church members would be doers of the word, they would love their brethren and would be constantly seeking for unity and harmony. Um, you know, when it came to the organization that this movement was doing, um, it definitely was not, uh, people were not seeking unity and harmony. Um, this was more people looking for control, whether it was, Parminder and Tabo, or even on the local level that we experienced here in Canada in trying to organize. It was basically people jockeying for position, people wanting to be heard, wanting to be in control of what was happening. There wasn't this spirit of unity and harmony, which I've seen operate. Uh, it's very different spirit. Um, a lot of talking doesn't need to be done when people are seeking unity and harmony. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Yes. Now, in the, in the situation with this, 
little children find it much easier to get along with other children because they have no preconceived ideas. In the situation with Miller's rules, there are many that would view Miller's rules as being a very crude method of studying scripture. Several years ago, I had this conversation. I was being, it was being recommended to me that I needed to be using Strong's Concordance. And the comment that was made there was that everyone knows Cruden's is for the crude, Young's is for the young, Strong's is for the strong. Now, the thing that I have found in these studies that this type of explanation has actually been exactly the opposite. Strong's has been more of a crutch. Young's offers some level of refinement, but Cruden's offers us more of a very refined and elevated way of being able to look at things within scripture. I, I got a, a little comment about that. Uh, okay. It's not that it's not that I disagree with you in any way, but it's been my findings that um, I need to look at all of the sources of okay. these things and it helps me to decide where I'm going to place something or, you know, like a word or a definition of a word or that type of thing. It, 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 it just, if you dip from the same source all the time, you will become um, uh, dissatisfied with other sources. And so I, I try to get all the sources in and kind of make that decision you know, on the fly, because some guy has one thing that sounds really good and another person sounds good, really good. And, and what do we say about the multitude of, of, uh, of counselors. witnesses, counselors, that's right, <clears throat> um, the multitude of counselors. And so that's why I particularly use them all, not just the one. I, I go through them all. I'm kind of like a Theodore, how, he, how he's got all his different references inside that, uh, that e-Bible, that uh, we use. Right. Yeah. So the one thing I would say is that without Cruden's, um, because, because he's not looking at the Hebrew and the Greek, he's looking at the English. So Cruden's is a little bit different, even though the Strong's and Young's, they both um, kind of do something similar. Uh, if it, when it came to the idea of the daily, the taking away, he would have drawn different conclusions if he had used Strong's. Right. He wouldn't, wouldn't have connected those two because he would have just been looking at trying to connect um, the Hebrew. I mean, even though it's like English, but, you know, you people become dependent upon this dictionary. And, and there is, Strong's has a lot of problems with it. Um, one is because he how he sort of groups the definitions of words together is misleading. But all of them have been used by God at different times. And um, I think the most important thing in, in Miller's rules is uh, the last rule, the one that's the most important, that we must have faith. And by that, he means obedience. Agreed. In order to understand God's word, we need to be obedient and and what man has done is we've we've side, sidestepped the obedience part and we just use the intellect. And and there is a place for the intellect. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we need it in order to understand God's word. But intellect alone is insufficient. And if we are going to be led as a movement, we have to be obedient to God. And that's not to man. That's not to man's ideas. 
when we study God's word, there comes a conviction. And that conviction must lead to action. And if it doesn't, it's all just a pretense. It's all just a cloak for sin. And, you know, we have seen in ourselves, all of us in this movement, that we are not right with God. God has been leading us. But in order for him to continue to lead us, we must be obedient to what he is showing us. Amen. I agree. The point, the ultimate point, is that many within the corporate church today would choose to set aside Cruden's concordance just as they have set aside Miller's rules. And, and what they've done is they set up man's intellect above God's word. Yes, agreed. So when Christ is telling us, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is a huge warning for us at this time. The world's redeemer spoke these words and no one need misunderstand them. The true mark of Christian character is plainly set before us. In spirit, the Christian is to be gentleness itself. The Christian is not to strive to, for the highest place. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, Christ declared, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, verse 4. Man is to humble himself. No other soul can do this work for him. It is the work of his own heart to cultivate the submission of a little child. The lack of this heart work is the reason why there is so much dissension and strife among Christians. The lack of this heart work is the reason why there is dissension within the movement. Those who believe in Christ and walk humbly with him, not striving for supremacy, who watch to see what they can do to help and to bless and to strengthen the souls of others, cooperate with the angels who minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. Note, please, there is a three-step point being made here by Mrs. White. Those who believe in Christ and walk humbly with him will do first what they can to help, second, what they can to bless, and third, what they can do to strengthen the souls of others. Jesus gives them grace and wisdom and righteousness, making them a blessing to all with whom they are brought in contact. The more humble they are in their own estimation, the more blessings they receive from God, because receiving does not exalt them. They make a right use of their blessings, for they receive to impart. They receive to give to others. The ministering angels receive instruction from the throne of God to cooperate with human instrumentalities. They receive the grace of Christ to give it to human beings. They are commanded to impart to Christ's disciples the spirit and power essential for the success of the work. 
A desire to be first is the greatest hindrance to the advancement of the work. How many times over many years did we see others come to the, the, the forefront of the movement with the attitude, Elder Jeff is wrong. I am here to return the movement into its proper path. Did we not see this with Tess and Parminder? Did we not see this with Emiliano? Did we not see this <clears throat> with others that are now no longer part of this movement? Christ cannot cooperate with the one who feels and thinks, I am superior to these men who have not the capabilities that I possess. When man feels he cannot do anything of himself, Christ lifts him up and strengthens him. Whosoever shall receive one such little child receiveth me. Christ continued, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. Verses 5 to 7. Here again, we are presented with the image of a millstone. Not the part of a millstone that was cast down upon Abimelech, but an entire millstone being shown to be hung around the neck of one that offends one of these little ones. Brothers and sisters, Christ herein was not talking of children. Christ herein was giving instruction to us. And just for clarification, so a millstone that is the upper millstone is the only one you could hang about a neck. Right. So so the bottom millstone is just flat, doesn't have a hole in it. The upper millstone has a hole in it. Isn't it also stationary? The bottom one is stationary and the top one is the one that moves. Yep. Yep. Agreed. I, I've used I've used a, a mill to grind flour before. Not a big one, you know, not one powered by an ox, but empowered sure if a woe is pronounced on the world because of offenses how much greater is the sin when the offense comes from those who profess to love christ if we make the profession that we love christ if we make the profession that we are capable of writing baptismal vows and yet we are willing to cast out other brothers and sisters because we disagree with them. How are we then representing Christ? Well, we're, we're really not representing Christ at that point. You're representing Satan at that point. So he's not a very good. Uh, so what do they do to traitors? What did they do to those that couple that gave up the the nuclear secrets to Russia? Um, what do they do to people that um, that are traitors? I mean, it's just what do you think God's going to do? <laughs> well, you ask a question about a couple. I'm assuming you're speaking of the Rosenbergs, right? Julius and Ethel. Yeah, the ones that gave up the, the documentation or supposedly gave up the documentation for the Russians. Okay. To the Russians. 
In the book of Acts, we have the example of a couple mm. that proceeded. I don't know where this is going. <laughs> okay. This couple made a vow that they were going to sell a piece of property. Mm. And yet they kept back some of the proceeds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what happened with them? Uh, he dropped dead and then she dropped dead. And wasn't it a situation that they were given the opportunity to admit what they had done? Yes, in front of the apostles. And yet they would not admit they continued in their lie? Mm. If a woe is pronounced on the world because of offenses, we are given three woes. How much greater is the sin when this offense comes from those who profess to love Christ? To depreciate or hurt one that loves me, Christ said, is to treat me, his savior, in the same way. If we are choosing to cast out brothers and sisters in this movement, we are then casting out Christ. If we are seeking to silence brothers and sisters in this movement, we are then seeking to silence Christ. If we seek to silence Christ, are we also not seeking to silence his spirit, the Holy Spirit? Christ has identified himself with suffering humanity. And those who wound and bruise their brethren wound and bruise Christ in the person of his saints, and they will one day realize the sad result of their course of action to themselves. Mrs. White was very clear in 1888 that had Christ himself appeared before that conference, before those brethren that were mocking and jesting the messages of Jones and Wagner and Ellen White, that they would have crucified Christ anew. This paragraph is one of the most damning, directly condemning paragraphs that I have read regarding the condition of the movement today. This points fingers at me. I am not choosing to point fingers at anyone else. I choose to take the responsibility myself. Well, Dwight, to be honest, that's why we actually started these studies is because right. we, we, we wanted to know. Agreed. You know, I mean, sometimes I remember what my father used to say was, be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, here we are today. We're getting what we've asked for. And, and today, as with every day, we have make choices. We have to make choices based upon our understanding. And the more he um, enlightens us, the better our choices can be. I'm not saying that we will make those right choices. I'm just saying that they can be different choices. It's kind of hard to get rid of our our human nature and um the thing that sister white kept saying about or not kept saying but said on a couple of occasions that every every breath should be a prayer and it's it's begin i mean i never quite understood it but <laughs> here lately i've been i've been getting a, a real good slapping around to 
let me know exactly what she was talking about. You know, every every breath should be a prayer, so we so we can make those choices correct. You know, when somebody comes to us and says something to us, that we take that moment to actually reflect on God and the choices that we can make and ask him to make help us make the right choice. Right. How often do we do that? I mean, really, most of the stuff that we do is just, you know, uh, reactionary. Stuff that's been programmed into us. You know what I mean? We, we, right. pro we do the programming and other, other sources give us that programming. But we can't actually change our programming. We have to ask for Christ to change that programming in us. Yes. Am, right. am, am I, am I close? <laughs> because that's what I'm coming up with over these, over these studies. Well, several months ago, there was a brother that's in this movement that castigated me very directly for a comment that I had repeated that, that, that my mother has used in the years when I was growing up. He took, he took great umbrage with this comment, which was the faults you see in others are those you most need to correct within yourself. That's a good one. Well, this brother felt that I was directing many down an incorrect path. This paragraph says quite a bit to us as I see it today. It says quite a bit to me. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10. This statement is repeated again and again in Christ's teaching. Worded differently, but meaning the same. I am condemned by the scribes and Pharisees, Christ said, for eating with publicans and sinners. But I call not the righteous who suppose they have a legal claim to God's favor, but sinners to repentance. Since this is the work of Christ that Christ came to do, take heed lest any jealousy by accusation and evil surmising you caused those Christ came to save to be driven away and to be lost. Of those who do this, Christ declares, if there were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. Matthew 18, 6. We need to bring into our practical life all the pleasantness that comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we are co-laborers with him, we shall do the work that he did when he was in this world. It is essential that we know how to pray more, how to press our petitions effectually to the throne of grace, that the rich current of the love of God may flow into the heart to be diffused in kind words and deeds of tender compassion. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, Christ declared. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 10. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, 
he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found the sheep that was lost. Luke 15, 3 to 6. See what the good shepherd will do when one of his sheep is lost? He goeth out into the desert and searches until he finds it. When it is found, he takes it upon his shoulders or to his breast of infinite love. And his song of rejoicing reaches the heavenly courts. I have found my sheep, which was lost. In that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear thou not. And to Zion, let not thine hand be slack. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3, 16 to 17. I see that our time today is coming to a close. We will stop here. There is yet much that she has offered and that has been offered by prophets such as Zephaniah that prophesied during the time of Josiah a time of reformation in this of the nation of Israel. May we see such a reformation today within the movement. May we see such a reformation within our own hearts so that we may be joined to one another with joy and gladness and become as fearful as an army with banners. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to join together, to study together, to consider together this which we need for ourselves and for our personal growth as your disciples. Help us now and guide us so that your will may be done in our lives. Help us that we may surrender all so that we may truly be prepared to take up our cross and to follow you. We thank you for these Sabbath hours, for the blessings that you have provided. We ask that we may make good use of these hours to come to understand and to be guided by you to do those things that you would have us to do. Direct us now in this path that you have set before us. For this, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.